Welcome to Agile Roots 2010, sponsored by Version 1, Rally Software, Vireo, Amirsis, Agile Alliance, and XMission Internet. Expressing Design in Code, Architecturally Evident Coding Patterns, by Dr. George Fairbanks. I'm going to talk today about uh, expressing design intent in code, which is very similar to a talk that was just in here uh, recently. Uh, his focus was on uh, how much design should you do. Uh, I'm actually going to talk about, uh, in the code, how can we express the design that we've got. Uh, I work for a, I have a consulting training company on software architecture um, called Rhino Research. Okay, so who am I? Um, uh, I have a PhD in software engineering. We, um, I did a, a thesis on frameworks and static analysis, which I absolutely love. So if you love frameworks, come talk to me afterwards. Um, I engage in uh, committees and uh, do reviews for stuff. Uh, but what you guys care about probably is on the right. Um, I, I'm an old time kind of uh, agile guy. Started doing a small talk project uh, actually back in 95. In 96, we convinced to move to eight month to two week iterations to, uh, everyone was very stressed about this thing, but uh, after a month of that, they were delighted as you might imagine. Uh, in 98, started doing test driven development, and recently uh, just written a book called Just Enough Software Architecture, which uh, until uh, Jim Copeland wrote his book, uh, which I think is due out like next month or something, uh, I was gonna say this is the first book to treat software architecture and agile uh, as, uh, as peers, as uh, reasonable things. You guys have probably seen other architecture books say something like, Use iteration zero, spend six months, and uh, do all your architecture or something ridiculous like that. Uh, this book hopefully doesn't do that. Okay, <laughs> so uh, I'm, I've only got a 45 minute talk, very short. So what I'm gonna try and do, does anyone remember how many patterns were in the design patterns book? 23. Okay, so I'm gonna try and do 21 in 45 minutes. So it's impossible, right? Uh, can anyone do voices? Can anyone do Edna Mold and do her quote here? You guys remember this? <laughs> He's like, it's impossible, that box is busy. Or something. <laughs> That's uh, so good. We're gonna try, we're gonna run it through here. Oh, do you know the story behind that? It was uh, Brad Bird that actually did that. So he was looking for somebody uh, to do this. I think it was, um, uh, I can't remember her name. Anyway, uh, female comic. And she goes, no, I think he's nailed it already. So he just did it himself. So the question I have for you guys is, I come in, I'm coming in here like a, a lion into the, the, uh, the sheep's den or something here, uh, talking about architecture. And my question for you guys is, uh, agile and software architecture. Are these things anathema or are these two things compatible? Okay, so I have one shaking hand, shaking hand, I think that means good, that they're compatible. Anybody yeah, else have concerns? Yeah. Absolutely, okay, so good. Uh, I think we've selectively selected the right population here. Everyone else is at another <laughs> talk saying, what is this idiot talking about? <laughs> uh, so I happen to believe that they are. Um, however, you can sort of, by reading between the lines, there's a lot of rhetoric around agile and people tend to de-emphasize uh, software architecture because it comes with a lot of baggage. However, let me do two slides to set the tone here. Um, the first question I have for you guys is, why is Toyota build good cars? And I, ask, I give you a choice. Is it because they do lean development or because they have automotive excellence and engineering? Which one is it? Yeah. Why does it have to be one? Exactly, it's a false choice. Uh, you see through all my subterfuge, right? I'm <laughs> terrible. You guys are too, too quick. So um, one conclusion you could draw is that lean development is what makes them Toyota, okay? But if I did lean development, I would make terrible cars because I know nothing about how to make cars, okay? So you really have to have both. So my second question to you guys is, where does your design knowledge come from? You sit down, you do some pair programming, you're gonna build something, you've got great uh, user stories. Um, your design knowledge, does it come from inference from having done lots of projects and you get to be a good developer? Or does it come from books? Did you read books on how to be a good designer? Which one did you do? Both. And, and obviously the answer is both, okay? Now, um, Agile brings a whole bunch of technical practices with it, right? test driven design has been like the biggest revelation. I mean, for a long time, text, uh, testing was unsexy, great. But now everybody does it, everyone is reasonable, it's great. We do pair programming and so forth. But, but that doesn't mean that there aren't other technical practices that we need to, to master, okay? And so I was uh, anticipating perhaps I'd have to sway the crowd more, but uh, it looks like you guys are already with me. So um, the way I think about this, and I try to explain this to people, is that although architecture comes with a lot of baggage, we need to disentangle three different things. The first one is the role of an architect, and that's a choice you can make inside of an organization. You can have an architect or not. You can have a head designer, you can not have a head designer. You can have a team of developers. Second thing is the process you go through called architecting, or perhaps you could use scrums, or you could use any other process in here. And then the third thing is the architecturers, 
that is an artifact. Okay. Now, uh, I ask you a question. When, I, when you look at a car that's driving along the road, do you have any idea what roles they have inside their company or what sort of process they were following to make the car? No. No, but can you tell me if it's a hybrid or if it's internal combustion or if it's you know a truck platform or any of that sort of stuff? Yeah, I mean, there's technical things about it that you can inspect the artifacts. Okay, in their case, it was a car. In your case, it's a, it's a website or it's a, a controller for a th thermostat or something. But the point is that my emphasis here is to talk about this third thing, and this is meant to be uh, a bridge which happened to fall down, and so we want to use proper uh, techniques for building, so make sure things don't fall down. And that guy's supposed to be some scary architect. <laughs> my, my belief here is we can switch this around a little bit. Instead of uh, architects architecting architectures, we could have agilist agiling architectures. Uh, so there's no reason we can't have uh, the agile software development roles, the agile processes, and we are still talking about the same technical uh, features of the code. So I would say that architecture aids agile. Well, you guys can even read my little note here. It says absolutely illiterate. Anyway. <laughs> so, so second an answer. You have to read because you're in the front. Yeah. Got all the way to the top. Yeah. Yeah. An answer. An answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, my name doesn't begin with A. Okay. So. Uh, here's the basic structure of the talk. Uh, we just talked about some of the, the, the setup here. Uh, we're going to talk next about what the heck is design intent. Uh, we're going to then have to do a little bit of background because not everybody's on the same page. When I say architecture, you may think something different. So I'm going to give you uh, what I'm going to talk about here, uh, my, my background in this. And then finally, the bulk of the talk will be down here uh, on all those patterns for encoding design. Okay. So uh, sometimes people like to say, use the code loop, right? Use the source loop, right? Have you heard this expression, right? Um, because all the truth lives in the code. And I'm going to argue that all the truth does not live in the code, okay? Uh, so this is a thing from Wikipedia on code obfuscation. Apparently they took this on the left and turned it into that on the right, and they are equivalent, right? They're mathematically equivalent. You can do a function that turns one into the other. And you can make the argument that the one on the right is not the one that you want to maintain. Right? Because uh, the one on the left has a whole bunch of things inside of it that are embedded in it in terms of its structure and its naming and so forth uh, that allow us with our human brains, because that's just a, we are humans, right? We're not uh, the compiler, we're not the CPU. We can read this and understand this better and therefore be able to maintain it better and find bugs in it and all the good things we'd like to do. And even then, this doesn't represent all the knowledge. This program happens to compute primes and presumably it relies upon some uh, principles of math that allow this algorithm to work, which, you know, aren't expressed. Okay. I actually took a course a, a million years ago at the University of North Carolina on software engineering. For some reason, this guy thought the course should be about proving programs to be correct. And all the programs, uh, if you guys have ever done this, you got to go da 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 each line and you have to prove some uh, predicates are true and so forth. And when you go through a loop, you have to have a loop invariant. And all these loop invariants happen to rely upon some proof uh, or some property of pure math theory that I had never taken. So like this infinite series converges to pi. And I was like, wow, well no wonder no one's not proving, <laughs> no one's proving programs correct anymore because you have to have uh, these weird mathematical proofs. And who, who, I bet nobody here, do you write? They also have to prove compilers. Yeah, oh yeah. They have to prove everybody knows. Yeah. They prove compilers. Yep. <laughs> My, my point is, that it, is, is merely that uh, there's a lot of information you have as a designer that isn't going to be expressed here in the source code, even if you put comments in, even if you do whatever else. Okay. However, so, so the point is the solution is not the design intent. This is the program code is the solution, and it doesn't necessarily represent all of the design intent. However, it's something that we want to get closer to. So I'm going to call the design intent is the system developer's understanding and desires with respect to how the system should be and how it should evolve over time. And what happens is we lose the design intent between uh, when we're sitting here chatting and we're just sketching on whiteboards and stuff, and then when we go and actually write down some Java code or some JavaScript or whatever it is, we lose the design intent. And it's the difference between what was understood when the program was written compared to when was evident from reading the program. Uh, you guys probably took a software engineering class as an undergraduate. Do you ever have that job where one person writes a spec and the other person has to implement it kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah, and so now that you're uh, grown up and you get to be paid to do the same thing, uh, similar things happen, which is that one person writes a program, the other person has to read through it and figure out what the heck is going on, okay? And a lot of the agile practices in terms of naming um, deal with how can we uh, make sure that we can convey that uh, to somebody else without writing you know, voluminous comments, uh, big design documents and so forth. But I'm still gonna assert that you can't encode all the design intent. 
Hoffman's economist conception and we can still do better. So your first answer, hopefully, is, well, wait a second, George, why can't we just, why can't we encode all the design intent? Any thoughts here? Yeah. You can probably spend more time documenting the, the code than you would writing, testing, and running it. I agree with that's true. Um, but can we think of any reason why, like, if I had an infinite amount of time, I couldn't express everything I wanted to? Yeah. It uh, tends not to express concepts that are from the domain. Uh, yes, it is, that is troublesome. Yes. Anything else? I think the intent that uh, any design intent you can provide is, is at best fixed at the moment in time when you wrote it. And then as soon as somebody comes and looks at it, that's all going to change. And I, I, mm -hmm. a lot of the ideas that you had in there are completely invalid. And the best they can do is figure out how do I take it from this intent to this new, this new structure. Okay, I agree with everything everybody said so far. Um, I have one, like, you know when there's there's like this killing stroke that like once you hear this argument, you're like, oh, of course, I won't even try anymore. Okay, so this is my, this is my idea of the killing stroke. Um, in your program, you can say what the program should do, right? You say, do these things, dot, dot, dot. It's an imperative language, it's an O language, it's a functional language. Somehow you're still giving instructions to the computer. When's the last time you wrote an instruction what the computer is not allowed to do? You can't. Right? Because you have a language which is geared towards encoding solutions. It's not geared towards encoding non-solutions. But do you ever want to tell the program in terms of design intent what not to do? Yeah. Yeah, like what? Like don't allow this. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, give me an example for this. <coughs> yeah. I would intend to capture that design intent in terms of a, a test that was supposed to fail. Yeah, we can get into that. But let's count that as extra linguistic, right? So the test driven inside. But okay, so here's an example. Uh, uh, if you want to have your cache be coherent, you can't circumvent the cache, right? If you circumvent the cache, the cache has stale data in it and you go grab things out, you're grabbing the wrong thing, right? So you, you say, if this cache is ever going to work, somebody can't be going to grab data and, you know, invalidate the cache, okay? I mean, simple stuff like that. That's your design intent. It's like, you know, everybody has to go through the cache, otherwise things don't work, right? right? So uh, there's these two guys, Rick Kaysman and Amnon Eaton, who came up with these two words, which uh, I don't, aren't intuitive to me, but this is what uh, the language they're using, intentional and extensional. And they said, intentional elements are ones that are universally quantified, like all filters can communicate via pipes. Uh, and extensional ones are ones that are enumerated or named and so forth. They say the system is composed of modules A, B, and C. So when you write in your programming language, you're saying, here's module A, here's module B, here's module C, okay? Now, sometimes you have intentional <coughs> rules that apply to all the extensional things that you define. So if you say, you know, I have got a filter A, filter B, filter C, and you say all those filters are gonna communicate via pipes and only via pipes, uh, that means that somebody can't come along and evolve the program to make them communicate via events or method calls or something else, okay? And so if you look at these architectural model elements, and I'm gonna review these a little, in a little bit, uh, you can say the extensional things are things like modules, components, connectors, ports, and component assemblies. And even if you say my language can't let me define a connector, right? I have to define that as a class or something. Um, when I look at the code, I can still see a correspondence between this was my design. I sketched these things on the board or chatted with them, uh, chatted with a colleague about them. And then I look in the code and I see that that's just a zoomed out version of this detailed thing that I see in the code. <coughs> However, there are a bunch of intentional things. So these are including styles, which are sort of like architectural patterns, right? Invariance, responsibility allocations, design decisions, rationale, protocols, quality attributes like uh, must be fast, um, and models. All these sort of things, uh, you're gonna have your code conform to those, like you were talking about with the test, right? But you can't generally express them directly in the code, right? You can't say this line of code, uh, you know, executes within 40 milliseconds, otherwise it causes the display to go boom, right? You can't say that. In Right, you just have to admit your code that respects it. Okay, so that's the problem. Here's the here's the exact problem. That it, what we're saying here is that sooner or later, no matter how good of a job you do of trying to express your design intent, you're going to end up with some things that are hard to express in the solution language in the programming language. Okay, so we got this problem, but we can do good things about it. So let me ask you a question here. Uh, which of these two, number one, number two, is the OO design? The first one has a pointer to an e-struct and a loop bar, loop bar, and the second one has airplanes, routes, and landings. Two. Yes, thank you very much. Now, why is it that number one is not the OO one? Okay, so what, what is, why is the second one describe objects? Why don't you think those are real airplanes? 
Well, they're abstractions. There's no abstractions in the first one. Yeah, yeah, very low, very, very low level. Well, okay, so I'm, I already gave away the answer here. The second line here is that object-oriented designs encode the domain, right? So you, you make, this was the observation with Simula back in 1967. They were writing this simulation, I can't remember what it was for, and after a while they realized, hey, wait a second, why don't we just write a language where we could directly express the things we're trying to simulate in the language? And then Alan Kay picked up on it and did small talk and the whole thing, and he said, what you really want to do is you want to have objects or classes that represent the things in your domain. So what you did was you express the domain inside the code, and we do this with lots of different ways. Variable names, class names, method names, and to some extent, object responsibilities. I mean, airplanes sort of act like planes from the real world, and that they can take off and land and so forth. Uh, but in other ways, airplanes do, airplanes in code do different things than airplanes in the real world, like you can say airplane.persist, whereas uh, real airplanes don't persist, right? You serialize your airplane into the air, and it's a serialized <laughs> So, okay, but the point is that we've been doing this expression of our design intent in the code for a long time. I'm saying it's, it's entrenched in the OO way of thinking about things. Uh, by the way, number one, I'm not saying is a bad design, right? If you're writing a device driver, this is probably the most effective way to do it, is to have pointers to blocks and stuff, and you can you know, shove these things around. Okay, so I'm going to show you my second favorite patterns book in the entire world. Uh, everyone should read this book. Uh, it's an oldie but a goodie. It's right there on the screen too. Uh, this is Kent Beck, Small Talk Best Practice Patterns. A friend of mine said, uh, I'm going to take your book and rewrite it as Java Best Practice Patterns. Okay, and just change all the small talk examples to, uh, to Java. 1997, wonderful book. Uh, in fact, I was having a conversation about this book last night with uh, uh, an old friend I, I happened to bump into here. And he goes, oh yeah, 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 I'm, I'm, there's this great pattern in here. I think I can find it. Um, and he tells me what it is and I say, yeah, it's the page that's turned down, right? There's one page turned down. And here's the quote. It's from this pattern called the intention revealing message, i.e. method name messages are messages in uh, small talk. What's going on in communication? Intention revealing messages are the most extreme case of writing for readers instead of the computer. As far as the computer is concerned, both versions are fine. The one that separates intention, what you want done, from implementation, how it's done, communicates better to a person. Right? And everyone would agree with this. I mean, this is why we call methods, uh, you know, toer calculate total expenses instead of T or X. Or someone was telling me about a code that they saw recently that was so horrendous that he named all the methods after movie stars. And so to get the real stuff done, you called Marilyn Monroe. And you know, pass in Gene Kelly as a parameter or something. It was ridiculous. None of us would ever do that because we're so used to embedding um, meaning into the method. So. Um, I've generalized this into something I call the model in code principle. Expressing models in code helps comprehension and evolvability. And so far we've seen the domain in the code. There's the standard OO programming style, which is coming from Mooch and from many other people, uh, where your classes mirror the things in the domain. Um, where there's a stronger version that Eric Evans actually advocates, uh, that you do domain-driven design. There's actually a chunk of your code that operates in the same way that's analogous to uh, how your, your domain works. And I would say from an academic perspective, we can't quantitatively say, yes, this stuff does work. There's no data out there on this. However, uh, the fact that we are all doing it and we all believe it's uh, true um, is probably good and I believe it's gonna be help maintainability. Um, but notice, uh, as soon as we try to express our understanding of the domain in the code, we have just opened the, do the door to technical debt. Right? Technical debt could be defined as the difference between how I believe things work and how the code does work. Right? And so by trying to make them match up, you open the door to them not matching up. Okay? So it's, a, it's both a, a blessing and a curse, um, because the debt is sort of inevitable, but now you can see it, right? Because you can look at this code and you say, this airplane is, um, I don't know, what, what is something airplanes don't quite do, right? Um, it's taxiing over grass or something like that. And airplanes don't taxi on grass, they only taxi on the, the pavement or something like that. So the idea down here is that we can put the architecture models in the code. Okay? And you might say, I don't build models, I'm an agilist. And I'd say, ha-ha, but you still have them in your head. <laughs> so I need to talk to you a little bit about what I mean by architecture model. There's examples that we're gonna be going through in the uh, last section here. I'm petrified about time. This is uh, normally a one hour talk, and I'm trying to do it in 45 minutes. Am I talking too fast, everyone? Is it okay? No. Okay. Okay, so um, those evil, bad software engineering guys. By the way, there's two categories of evil, bad software engineering guys. Uh, there's the process guys who you probably don't agree with, uh, who are the, the Watts Humphrey camp. 
Uh, and then there's the really not evil at all guys. <laughs> um, the uh, Paul Clements and Len Bass kind of crowd uh, that write the architecture books. Uh, and this is their definition from uh, the new version of the documenting software architecture book coming out this year. The software architecture of a computing system is a set of structures needed to reason about the system which comprise the elements, relations, and properties of both. I happen to like this definition better than some of the competing ones who say things like architecture is the stuff that's hard to change later because uh, it enumerates what the things are because my boss is hard to change later. <laughs> um, but I can't, you know, that isn't part of the architecture, right? Um, so I would say that every system has an architecture because you can look back on it, like we were talking about with the cars on the street, you can look back on it and see what it is, okay? Even if you didn't know what you were going to. It doesn't imply you have to plan up front your new three-tier system. You may evolve into a three-tier system, but it still has that architecture. Architects pay a lot of attention to quality <coughs> ethics. These are also called extra-functional requirements. They're sort of badly called non-functional requirements. If I had a drinking fountain that had a sign on it that said non-functional, what would you think? Right, exactly. Right. So let's use extra functional instead of non functional. But it's, it's almost impossible to remove that. Or sometimes called the giddy. Uh, things like latency, modifiability, usability, testability. And this is an open ended set. You can create new quality attributes uh, anytime you want. So the architecture you choose or you evolve into influences the system's quality attributes. Okay. Now, who's used Skype before? Almost everyone, I assume. Or some pretty accurate. Okay. Can anyone imagine Skype being written as a three tier system? Yeah, maybe, but it wouldn't be quite the same, right? Because like if the main Skype server crashes, then nobody gets to run Skype, right? But the neat thing about Skype is that it's completely, uh, it's, it's, it's reliant, you know, because it's peer-to-peer, -peer, and like anybody who turns on their computer gets to be joining into the mesh, okay? Um, do you guys know what the MapReduce pattern is? Uh, this is a, a kind of architecture that you could use for operating on enormous internet scale, as they say, size uh, data, and you can sort of chop it up, process it incrementally and then recombine it so that you can create, for example, the Google index, okay? Um, and since I'm in here and I have your attention for a moment, let me just do one last thing, uh, which is to say, uh, everyone always wants to draw their architecture as a layer diagram, okay? Have you guys seen this, where someone tries to force fit their architecture to a layer diagram? Mm -hmm. Not every architecture is a layer diagram, right? You can, you can build a perfectly good system that doesn't conform to a series of layers, okay? But everyone always feels like, they have their layers, and they have these bars on the side, and then they have some extra things, and because you know it doesn't line up in this stack like they want. That counted as one of the patterns. That work. Okay. Um, now, the standard way of talking about software architectures, at least from the architecture community, is as a series of views. Um, you might remember Philippe Cruchen's four plus one architecture views paper from a million years ago, um, and he said you can talk about these standard perspectives on the software system. Uh, the three primary, what they call view types these days, are the module, the runtime, and allocation. And this is a problem that's as old as the hills. Does anyone remember the go-to considered harmful paper? Right, okay. So the argument in the go-to considered harmful paper was, we should use structured programming. Why? Well, programmers are, uh, programmers being human, have a hard time moving from a fixed set, uh, set of statements to what's gonna happen at runtime. In other words, he was just thinking about like a method with you know go-tos and, and so forth in it. And you're trying to imagine what the sequence of operations are going to be at runtime. It's hard to make the jump between the module, what we would now call the module view type, and the runtime. Uh, in architecture, we think more about if I run this program, what sort of data structures and components and so forth pop up at runtime? What is the configuration of these things? Uh, and that still is hard. Nothing has changed. And then the third uh, one here is the allocation, which roughly says this software is going to run on this computer, this software is going to run on this computer, and there's a terabyte link between these two things. And, you Yeah, exactly. Deployment is another word for the allocation. Yeah, uh, allocation can be um, absolutely. Architectural styles. That is a dome wheel pushing a ball of dung. Um, the big ball of mud is argued to be the most common architectural style. If you guys ever come to some project and they have no internal divisions and the whole thing is just a big sea of objects, you know, and you're sort of like you pick on one thing and you're like, if you keep pulling, everything comes out. Kind of thing. Wait, there's some other kind. <laughs> So the question, which you can read at the top, is 
what, <laughs> what architecture intent do I encode? And this is the crux of the presentation, because this is the only part that's not obvious, because everything, once we get past this part, you guys aren't gonna remember the exact patterns I'll give you after this, but you're gonna be able to re-derive them, like on a physics test, when you forgot about that one thing, but you can figure it out from F equals MA and something else. Right? <laughs> so my question you guys is, what architecture intent do you think we should encode? Okay, excellent, that's what I wanted to hear. <laughs> because if you knew the answer, then I'm really not helping out. <laughs> so, okay. so my answer is gonna be, we're gonna encode a bunch of the intent we just talked about in terms of how do I map between the module view type and the runtime view type. If I have this concept that there is this chunk of code, which I'm gonna call either a module or a component, can I see those divisions when I look at the code? Uh, if I have constraints or properties, like this is an asynchronous call, can I see that when I get to the code? These are the kinds of things we're gonna take a look at. Okay, so we've got finally to the last section, and I got about 14 minutes. Okay, um, so here's the motivation. When you're reading code, you want to know who talks to whom, the invariance and constraints that you have to deal with. Uh, and by constraints, I don't mean like we've only got $50. I mean like uh, uh, it must be written in Java or you know, don't do this following thing. Uh, messages that are sent and received, files and patterns that are in use, performance requirements or guarantees that you have to make, data structures used for communication. Uh, by the way, all these are generally fairly easy to see in an architecture model, right? If I go over here to the board where we're, we're, we're pair programming, you say, hey, let's go over the whiteboard, let's talk about this for a second, and I draw the client, and I draw the server, and I draw a line between them, right? It's hard in your code to see those three things, strangely enough, right? It, or it can be, unless you go out of your way to make it clear. So these are the kinds of things we'd like to see. So. Um, what I am calling, uh, I, I, I stole this language from uh, David Garland, my advisor, uh, an architecturally epic coding style. Uh, imagine you could write two different programs, A and B, and they're functionally equivalent, sort of like that obfuscated code and the beautiful code, okay? We're gonna call one the normal approach, and then what we're gonna talk about here is the architecturally evident style, so that when you read that program, the architecture is more evident, as evident as we can be, or as, as we would like to make it, uh, to the person who's reading it. Again, we don't care what the computer thinks, we care about what humans think. So we're gonna provide hints to the humans, we're already doing that right now, like total expenses instead of just T, and we're using in, uh, intention to reveal like method names, like uh, can't back to death. But we're also gonna do something else, we're gonna express architecture ideas. We're gonna provide hints, we're gonna do more than is necessary for the program to compile. I'm gonna say that again. We're gonna do more than is necessary for the program to compile, okay? That's what, uh, I mean, T works just as well, total expenses, but we're gonna go beyond that here. And the benefits here, hopefully, again, this is just an assertion, just like the domain and code part is an assertion. We hope to avoid future code evolution problems, improve developer efficiency, reduce the amount of time spent inferring the code. Uh, we'll hopefully have a lower documentation burden if you guys are even documenting, but you know, it'll be even that, even that much easier. And uh, hopefully new developers will be able to ramp up even faster. And the idea here in this, this last part says that you should be able to infer these things now that uh, you know what I'm talking about. Okay. So, uh, one last piece of background information is that there's, uh, we're gonna use two different kinds of mechanisms to express the design intent, which I'm calling hard and soft mechanisms. Soft mechanisms are ones that are like method names where the, com the computer couldn't uh, care about this, uh, whereas hard mechanisms are machine checkable. Um, who's used EJBs, uh, at least EJB3 kind of stuff? Okay, so you know EJB2 used to just have a type system where you'd say, I need to implement this interface and you'd implement your remote interface or whatever for EJBs. In the new one, you put annotations in the code, right? Um, now, what checks the annotations? Uh, there's some sort of compiler that runs through, checks the annotations, and then binds everything up for you, right? So there's a hard mechanism that causes that stuff to work. Um, so other examples of hard mechanisms are things like pre and post conditions, if you have something that checks them, uh, assertions, um, the language type system that doesn't let you put strings inside of integers and stuff like that, unless you program in the language that lets you do that. Um, design patterns like facade work like this and so forth. Uh, Pre-compilers and so forth. Okay, those are all hard methods. So here's the example I'm gonna use for uh, the, the patterns, for describing the pattern. Imagine a friend of mine actually built one of these, uh, an email answering system. And the idea is you stick in an email, uh, and what you wanna put out at the end is either I figured out how I can answer this email, uh, or uh, I give up and you have gotta have a human read this thing, I couldn't figure it out. But the idea is if you have a company that processes a lot of uh, monotonous emails, like where's my stupid package? Um, and if you happen to notice a package number in there and stupid package, 
as keywords uh, going through this network, hopefully you could uh, automatically send them back a response that says, we believe your package is in Sacramento, and um, you know, if you want more information, write us again. So the idea in this, this diagram, oh, here's a question for you guys. Uh, this picture, is this a, a picture of the code, you think, or do you think this is a picture of the runtime cycle? It's a little unfair because you didn't draw a picture. Make a guess. Runtime structure. Exactly. And why do you think it's the runtime structure? Well, I don't see anything that corresponds to, to how you would actually do it. I, I agree with both of yeah. you. Whoever said flow and the, and the runtime structure, exactly so. Um, because binding. Yeah, binding's a good, a good, a good yeah. key. Um, so here, let me just walk you guys through this. Input cleanup would be saying, here comes a message. I need to strip out any HTML tags or email headers or whatever I need. Tagging is where you go through and say, I think that's a noun, that's a verb, and that looks like a product number. Uh, multiplexer just makes copies of the message, and then you run it through a whole bunch of feature interactors in parallel. Um, this thing was, uh, I'm not a linguist, a friend of mine who's a linguist told me this is how you would do it. So um, then you, you recombine that into one message, and then based upon some uh, technology, it could be a neural net or something else, uh, you classify whether or not you can answer this message as uh, this is a request for uh, package status, and then you can output it. Does this make sense pretty much? Okay, um, so here's the first pattern. Uh, we would like to express module dependencies. And uh, when I mean module, I'm talking about a chunk of code. When I say component, I'm talking about something that exists in the runtime. Okay, that's just the way architects, the architecture guys talk about it. So modules, of course, depend on other modules. And we try and control the dependencies between these things. We try to prevent cycles and so forth. Uh, we may have no upward dependencies as a restriction. And Java 7 is going to have more support, by the way, uh, if it ever comes out. Um, <laughs> here's, the, here's the first idea of a pattern, is we want to use a tool to just express the dependencies. Okay? Uh, there are some open source things like Verify Design. There's some academic work like uh, on module systems for Java. Uh, another option is to use um, a framework. Okay, if you guys ever used OSGI or .NET bundles or anything like this, assembly, sorry. The OSGI? Yeah, now you notice in these things, these are uh, systems that allow you to say this depends on this, and this can be recombined with this, or this can't be, okay? So essentially those things add to the semantics of language you're working in, okay? So, so that's one pattern, is to use some external tool or external language to express the dependencies. Uh, you could also put comments in the code. Now, why is that not very satisfactory? You get out of sync pretty quickly. Yeah, you get out of sync really quickly. Uh, you can't check it, like you can't run a tool across it to check to make sure that Again, it's hard to express the negative stuff, like whatever you don't depend on this, uh, that kind of stuff. You can't force people to do things. You, yeah, that's uh, another <laughs> Yeah. Um, we get so dependent these days on the alt space or whatever the command completion is in your IDE, um, because just like you start using stuff, and if it's marked as private, it won't show up for you to call, and then you know, you're like, I didn't know I wasn't allowed to call that. Second one, uh, oh sorry, this one is just related on package structure. Imagine that for that uh, email processing system, I organize my package this way. Here's my email answering system with the infrastructure package, and inside there's a Python filter style. There's a package for the system with head and has components and interchange in there. Uh, my first question is, what can you learn from this package structure? Yeah, you can probably infer for a particular class based on what package it is, and it's in what it's intended or mm -hmm. what it's supposed to do. Okay. Anything else? Sorry, say again. You are dividing your modules, you are separating them in packages. Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, there's a lot of things you could learn from this, okay? Now, could you imagine a different packaging style? Is that how you guys package your stuff? It's not the only good one, but it's one that expresses certain kinds of things. In this case, it would be easy to find where the components are, right? It would be easy to find where the data structures are that go between the components, and presumably this is where the style uh, things are, okay? The pack type of stuff. Um, and so again, the compiler doesn't care how you organize your packages, but you do. So think about that. Uh, so the next pattern here is the module component alignment. Uh, I have the source code. I group that into things I'm going to call modules. Those are going to get instantiated at runtime. Not everything gets instantiated. When's the last time you instantiated a math library? You don't. It doesn't have any runtime structure. But you might instantiate clients more than one time and maybe just one server, right? So what we want to do is make the, the components visible in code. Um, we don't have to make the components of modules line up, but it's a lot easier if they do. Uh, here's one pattern, is to align the module component boundaries. You can say things like modules A, B, and C become component Y. Uh, to put concrete names on that, let's say that 
the, uh, uh, the GUI toolkit and the uh, field checking logic and the something or other makes the uh, client. Another way you could do this sometimes is you can make a one-to-one -one align between a module and the uh, and what gets instantiated, the component. Uh, that's generally very hard to do. Uh, just imagine if you share one module and two different components, then you break the one-to-one. -one. Uh, another pattern here is using a module for different interchange types. So you can find out exactly what the vocabulary is, the stuff that goes between uh, two different modules or two different components. Okay, I told you this would be a tough talk. Next pattern is a uh, modular runtime mapping. Um, the desire here is to make your runtime structures evident uh, in the source code. Uh, now, it's easy to read code and sort of see an algorithm because it's all sort of in front of you, okay? You can see 100 lines or 20 lines or some other <coughs> lines of code on your screen. But it's hard to infer what runtime structures are gonna pop out. Uh, for example, what components are instantiated or what the topology of these things is gonna be. So if you look at some code, you might be able to figure out from the names that there's clients and servers. It's harder to figure out how many clients are gonna appear at runtime, okay? Unless you write the code in a certain way. Here's one pattern. Centralize the architecture instantiation. Uh, this works great if your architecture doesn't change at runtime. Do you guys have architectures that are static or dynamic? Who's got dynamic architectures? Like at runtime, could it be like two clients one minute and seven clients the next minute and you know no clients? Well, then that's dynamic architecture because essentially you're changing the top all But other architectures like Microsoft Word, Maybe it doesn't, but let's just say it does. When you start Word, everything is there, right? And it just runs until you turn it on. Okay. Um, you could do things like co-locate things in the code. Step one is creating the instances. Uh, we're gonna see an example of this in a minute. Second is to attach all the instances, and the third is to, to start, okay? Um, the alternative to this is that when somebody reads your code, they have to search around to find where everything is, gets instantiated, and who gets to talk to you, okay? Um, uh, here's another example of that pattern is um, let's say you've got a GUI and you've got a backend. Uh, sometimes the GUI can talk to the backend from any part of the code, right? And so you've got just like all kinds of widgets talking back to the backend. Another pattern you see is to hoist uh, the initialization and configuration. So if you ever use Struts or EJB or OSPI, you notice you have to have a configuration file on the side that says A talks to B, okay? So you have actually usually a different language that expresses the, the topology and the connection. Uh, the last one, I'm gonna skip that. Okay, so here's an example of that kind of code. So for my application here doing the email processing, I might have a main routine that creates pipes, filters, and the, okay, creates pipes and filters and starts the filters. In the create pipes, I do things like, uh, this is a new pipe, this is a new pipe, filters is, I create a couple filters and so forth. And then finally, when I start, I go ahead and start those things running. So each one runs its own thread. Okay. So the alternative is that I could have scattered the, the creation assembly throughout the code. The computer wouldn't care less because the computer doesn't care where I put this stuff, but the person who's reading it might be in uh, good shape okay, by looking at it this way. Okay, so here's the next uh, desire, is to make components visible in the code. Uh, we can use a naming convention. So you could prefix or postfix the name with components, like tagging components, uh, to, to represent the components of tagging in the uh, example. Another one is we can actually reify a component type. So in other words, um, what is that pattern called where you use an interface that marks something like serializable? Is that a marker? Yeah, yeah. marker. Marker interface, yeah. We can do the same sort of thing, right? We can just mark them all with component, right? Or we can actually have an abstract superclass called component. Um, and that works pretty well. Uh, another pattern here is uh, you can have fields to hold the ports and the connectors. Uh, I'm gonna skip over that because you guys aren't hard to um, But notice that uh, if you have any Cross component checks, you could actually put them in this class uh, to, to, be, to be run that. Um, so here's an example of that. So we can make an abstract public class filter extends component, um, and it's got some uh, template pattern here that allows it to run. And the nice thing here is that it standardizes the startup code with the run and work template pattern. And if you're in your IDE, you can press your magic key, like F4 or whatever, and show all the subclasses of filter or component, and then you can quickly navigate to what you're, you're trying to find. Okay, because remember, what you're trying to do is communicate to the other programmers, you're not trying to communicate to the, to the code, uh, to, the, to the machine. <coughs> okay, next uh, pattern here is we wanna make the components visible in the code. Uh, and so, that's just a connector, not a component. Um, Sorry about that. Uh, so 
we've got all different kinds of connectors, method calls, event dispatches, shared variables, whatever. But what we want to be able to differentiate is the intra-component versus inter-component communication. Um, right now, when you call a method, it just looks like every other method, right? A, a calls B, okay? But what we want to be able to see is, oh, here's this chunk of code I call it the client, here's this chunk of code I call it the server, and they have a different kind of communication that's going to go over some distinguished channel, uh, whether it's a remote method call or a, a socket call or whatever. And we can use a naming convention here to make the connectors visible, just like we did before. We can actually make a connector superclass. And one opportunity here is we can move responsibilities into connectors to make them smart, so they can actually do some error checking or check the protocols and so forth. Here's an example of this in the code. So what we did here was we created a class for pipe, parameterized by T, uh, that extends connector. And we implemented uh, using the Java util concurrent uh, queues. Uh, and the idea is then you can read and write to these pipes so that we can send email messages along. Yeah, especially like the JDBC connector where then that's going to send the JDBC Well, the JDBC connectors are an example of a kind of connector, right? That they do a special connector from your code to a database. Yeah, and so they have different types of connectors depending on which type of database you're talking to. Yeah, but they have the same API on the, on the connector. Okay. Now, notice that this is different from the last code you saw. The last code you saw, this one, this one said this is an abstract public class. In other words, you create your own filters and put all your data in them. Uh, this is different. This is a final class. It says there's only going to be one implementation of pipe, and this is it. And it, it hoists all the concurrency nastiness so that nobody else has to deal with concurrency again. Okay? Um, I'm so sorry about the time. Uh, pattern is to make port types uh, explicit in the code. Uh, so in architecture, we talk about two different things. We talk about interfaces and we talk about ports. Interfaces are generally, well, there's the quote interface, right? This concept of interface, uh, which is very general. But uh, in concrete terms, we talk about interfaces in the code, like a Java interface, right? Which is a list of uh, method calls, essentially, uh, that we're exposing. Now, ports are something different. They are something that's available at runtime. Uh, so, for example, if you have an Apache server, and let's say it's got connections to three different clients right now, the clients are all using the same interface, right? That the API for Apache doesn't change. However, the state of the connection between me and each one of the Apache and each one of the clients may be different, okay? So the idea is you have three different ports um, that would, that would the port is not connected with the OS ideal, right? Like port 80 for the web server. This is just saying, you want to track the connection you have with each one of these guys. Any sense of an interface? Uh, it's very similar. You can chat offline. I'm sorry, the problem is I'm trying to shovel this background knowledge on architecture in at the same time. Um, yeah, just imagine like you want to track the state of an interface, you would do that with a port, right? So I think you're, you're on the right idea here. So the first thing we can do is we can either make, uh, we can reify the port, uh, and then the second pattern here is we can actually put the pro protocol tracking inside the port, and so then we could uh, check for errors and so forth. Okay, uh, another thing we might want to do is uh, make property styles and patterns visible in the code. Again, we can do this with a naming pattern. So we can do things like asynchronous write and read only provided, uh, provided in this report. We can also do that with annotations rather than names. So you can put an at synchronous or an at read only on each one of these things. And the good news is this probably enables better machine checkability than the first one. The first one's a soft mechanism, this one's a hard mechanism. Uh, and the last one is that you can express styles and patterns with names. Now you guys already do this with design pattern stuff, right? You go da 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 visitor, right? You know, so now you know it's a visitor pattern. Um, and you can do the same thing with uh, with architectural styles. Uh, so the fact that anyone thing is labeled a filter or a pipe indicates you're probably using the pipe and filter pattern here. Okay, uh, making invariants uh, visible in the code is tough again because they're intentional. That is, for all elements, don't do this thing. Um, so the first thing you could do here is you could bake the invariants into the API. If you guys ever use a hash table, you'll notice that you can't add a key without a value, right? So what they're saying is it doesn't make any sense to do uh, the addition of just a key or just a value. So we're going to do something like this, add key value. And this would be a bad API, right? Because this would allow me to break the invariant. So the good news is um, that it's enforced. Uh, the bad news is it's invisible. And as the API is involved, the developers may accidentally break the invariant. Now, I'm not talking about like you maintain your own code, but you're doing the alt space and you start you know, coding something up and you don't know that you broke the invariant. Okay, uh, the next one is you express the invariants in the classes. You can do things like comments. Uh, there are modeling languages like JML or SpecSharp. Does anyone use those? I guess not. 
Okay. Um, another one, as uh, is mentioned before, is you tests that are outside the code. Okay. Again, the test tends to be specific rather than for all uh, kind of tests, but it's certainly a lot better than nothing. Okay. Fancy pattern. Buried treasure. Now, if I use a naming convention like launch space shuttle for a method, uh, you get a pretty good idea of what responsibility that method is, right? Now, what if this thing actually calculates my bank balance and I call it launch space shuttle? Okay, I'm going to call that buried treasure, right? Because you think that it's going to do one thing, but it's really going to do something else. Don't surprise the reason. I'm two minutes over, so I can go real fast. All this stuff is dependent upon what your component frameworks are. If you're using OSGI or whatnot, then you're, uh, you use different things. Um, and here we are. Basically, developers know, know more about the problem domain and architecture than strictly necessary for the program to work. Design intent is lost between the, the design and the code. We talked about the intentional and extensional elements, and you can't express all the intentional stuff in the code, but we can provide hints. The modeling code principle says that we can express our domain in the code, but the idea here in this talk is expressing the architecture knowledge in the code, specifically the mapping between the module view type and the runtime view type, because humans are generally bad at that. The benefits here is prevent loss of Hard one architecture knowledge. Um, architecture uh, is compatible with Agile, and um, got a couple of resources here. There's book chapters on my website, and uh, there's an architecture news site I'm trying to get going, like Slashdot. So everybody subscribe via RSS. And I apologize for the time. Thank you very much. Thank you.